Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to a bonus episode of EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how's it going today? I'm so excited, Bryce. I've been looking forward to talking with our guest today for a, well, I... I mean, I always enjoy talking with him. I haven't known about it for this long, but I've, I've been really looking forward to today. Yeah, I have. I have too. So um, today, of course, we have friend of the show, EPL branch manager, uh, Kyle Marshall joining us. And I mean, I think I probably found out about it around the same time you did, Caroline. But uh, if you're not aware, uh, he was recently a contestant on an episode of Jeopardy. And Jeopardy is a show we've actually talked about on this show before. And we're both big fans. And to know that a friend of the show and a colleague of ours has been on Jeopardy, we, I, you know, I reached out to Kyle when I heard about this and I was like, Will you come on the podcast and chat with us about this, please? And he is joining us today. Kyle, you were you had a busy morning making the media rounds, but uh, how's it going today? It's going great. It's been a surreal experience back and forth with, with media these past two days, which I, I truly wasn't expecting given that, you know, I didn't bring home the win. It was a close game, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's been a whirlwind uh, fun adventure. My my 15 minutes is occurring right now, I guess, and <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> well, thank you for spending some of those 15 minutes here with us. I have to say that this, I, like, it, it honestly feels to me like I'm talking with a celebrity like this is we've been we've talked with authors who've been on oprah and people who've written books and a whole a number of really great guests on overdue finds and uh yeah you're you're kind of a celebrity right now you know it's funny it it, it doesn't feel like it it feels like hardly anything has changed i mean the the funny thing that we'll surely get into is that i, I taped this two months ago right so there's this delay and now all of a sudden this onslaught of of interest but yeah no i'm just still a regular branch manager caroline i've known you for for years and, <laughs> and i was you know for my 30 to 60 minutes of taping jeopardy that's the only thing that's changed <laughs> All right, I'll try to keep that in mind uh, as we go through. But we do have a lot of questions for you. As Bryce mentioned, we're both big fans of the show. We're, we're fans of game shows and television in general. And uh, yeah, this is definitely the closest I've come to talking with a Jeopardy contestant. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we just want to hear all about everything. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, if you're tuning in today, first of all, thank you for downloading. And also, you know, if you are just a fan of Jeopardy game shows, kind of like, how does that work? Like, what is how? Like, what's it like to be on a game show? What's it kind of like behind the scenes? Like, I think you're gonna love today's episode. And uh, so, let's get started. So, Kyle, uh, before we chat about your Jeopardy experience, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Have you? Is that a show that you've always watched? Has this been a show that you've always wanted to be on? Yeah, you know, strangely enough, no. Uh, uh, I grew up uh, loving trivia, uh, loving facts, curiosity. Like was a was a major, you know, uh, characteristic growing up, I, as with many people in libraries, and so. Um, just, you know, from a, from a kid, I was, when I was three years old, I had a dinosaur book where I was memorizing all their names. And, uh, and then I, you know, once I got a little bit older, I was super into atlases, you know, just like regular kids. <laughs> so, I, I am nodding because yes, that makes sense to me. Honestly, I was as well. It's relatable for, for some librarians. Right. And it was, it was, I was so into nonfiction books uh, at a certain point, fact books, anything with, um, uh, with statistics, like hockey stats books I loved as well. Um, my mom was like, why won't this kid read a story, like read a novel for crying out loud? Um, so, which is funny because in, as an adult, I, I consume mostly novels. Um, and, I, you know, nonfiction is mostly through the internet or podcasts um, is where I get that type of media. But yeah, I, I haven't had cable in um, in over a decade now, and so I haven't been watching Jeopardy. When it was on as a kid, I enjoyed it. I didn't religiously watch it for um, by any means, which is an interesting experience because most of the people who go on Jeopardy are super fans, and so they have such a great knowledge of the show and the way questions are asked and um, the history uh, that I didn't necessarily have. Um, but it all started kind of during the pandemic. Our friends Matt and Leah, um, who also had young children, we had uh, my 
partner Brady and I had a, a toddler, or he was a baby at the time, actually. And it was the time of social distancing and so and physical distancing. So we, we had these Zoom calls where um, Matt would have Jeopardy, he'd screencast, we had like a scoreboard. And he's a hardcore fan. And he was like, Kyle, you got to try out. And so <laughs> what we did is, uh, you know, I took the anytime test, which you can take as it says anytime just by typing in responses and uh then there were two more rounds and it uh that's that's kind of how it progressed from there but um and you may have questions about that later but it was uh an experience that i hadn't thought of my whole life though have been kind of a trivia nerd my whole life i'd say um so you you took the test you applied when did you hear back when did this actually start to get rolling yeah, so I'm, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. So the Anytime test I took in 2020, I think it was mid 2020. Uh, and then the next level, I can't quite recall when that was, um, but they only do intakes at certain times, I think. And so I got uh, an invite to do um, a, a test in which I was typing those responses, but it was synchronous and through Zoom so that they knew that it was you who was answering these responses. Still pretty laid back um, opportunity. And then last November, I was asked, invited for what they call the, the Zoom audition. So Basically, you're, you're paired with a bunch of people and they group you into groups of three, basically, and you're, you're trying to buzz in and they're calling on whoever they think buzzed in. Um, and they actually give you a, a little anecdote story opportunity. And then at that point, you're really on the casting list. And so it depends on how you performed, I guess, in addition to whatever type of casting they're trying to, to create for that um, environment. You have to, I'm sure, have a certain level of, um, of number of uh, questions answered correctly. Um, but uh, on my tape day, there were a lot of people who had been waiting for like a year and a half uh, to get that call after their audition. And it only took me, I guess, five months or so or four months. Um, I got the call I, when I was in Hawaii, actually, I got the call on vacation uh, and she was just confirming details, personal details uh, and the fact that I hadn't been um, <laughs> committed a crime or a felony in the last little bit, <laughs> which uh, thankfully I can tell your listeners I had not. <laughs> um, but I thought she was just like upkeeping the list. And then lo and behold, I got back um, and a day later after coming back from vacation was uh, at, invited down to film in a month in Culver City, uh, which is in the Los Angeles area. Did you tell work why you were going? Because you've just come back from Hawaii. Are you <laughs> now saying, I, look, I got to go to California? Totally. Yeah. I, and I, had, I just told my director and then I confirmed a little bit more about like, what can I share at this point? And everyone thought that I signed an NDA. I couldn't share anything. That's actually not the case. I, I couldn't share on social media leading up. Um, the outcome of the game couldn't spoil it. Couldn't spoil that I was on the game either on social media, but I could tell friends and, and family and, and coworkers. And so I let them know. The, the one thing is, though, they tape, they tape five uh, episodes in a day, so Monday to Friday, um, from the morning until, you know, later afternoon. I was on the Wednesday show, um, so I'd, had I won, I would have kept on going to the, for the Thursday and Friday shows after lunch, uh, and then they would have flown me back in about 10 days to film the, for the next tape day. Um, it was probably pretty clear to my colleagues that I wasn't taking a second random trip down to Los Angeles <laughs> at that point, but, I mean, they didn't know that I didn't win one or two games, so... Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was something I could share at that level. You said that they record like five episodes in a, in a day. So were you instructed, like, did you have to bring a bunch of different outfits specifically for, for your taping? Totally. Yeah. And it was, it was a couple things happened there. So one is, uh, you can't wear a lot of stuff on TV. So no green, no micro prints, uh, which is <laughs> frankly make micro prints is the majority of my clothing. So I was, I, I was a little hooped in that front. Uh, my partner Brady went out and I, I actually rocked a bow tie on the show, which was, uh, the first time I'd ever worn a bow tie in my life. <laughs> and they commented on it uh, when I walked on the stage, they were like, Ooh, intimidation factor, bow ties mean business. <laughs> so, so that was just kind of a fun way to spice up the outfit. But, um, um, you know, yeah, I did bring uh, four changes of clothing, um, and I actually was kind of freaking out because when I arrived, my parents had dropped me off. They came down to to watch the the, the taping and support me. It was so nice of them, um, but they dropped me off, and I left the changes of clothing in the trunk of the car, and I was freaking out about, like, oh, I got to get this. They're not going to let me on the show. Of course they're going to let me on the show, right? Like, <laughs> I, I'm going to be on one show at the very least, and then afterwards, they'll work something out, but... Yeah, thankfully, my clothing did pass a muster with uh, with wardrobe. There were some people who had to do slight changes on the day to make sure that it worked look good on TV. But yeah, it was it was kind of weird to plan out uh, a full weeks of clothing for for one day and and to pack that much clothing for what was a pretty quick trip for me. 
Yeah. Well, I imagine too, like for me, I would totally overthink it. Cause I'm like, okay, this is my first episode, but like, okay, if I'm making it to episode four, like what am I wearing here? Like I'm clearly, I'm clearly killing it here on Jeopardy. So what, what kind of power suit am I going to wear to intimidate everybody? <laughs> I think at that point your, your cred is so good that who cares what you wear, right? True. Like, yeah. <laughs> and most people just do variations on a theme like a jacket or a tie or something to just make it look slightly different. But Mayim Bialik, the host, she, she did pretty cool like complete wardrobe changes and was, was looking great on every show for sure. Going back to the time uh, between when you found out you were going to be on the show and you went down, it, it's not a long period of time. Did you do anything special to prepare for it? It was so hard, Caroline. To, like The first thing I did was Google Jeopardy preparation <laughs> because I, I was I was thinking like, you know, I've got a month. They can ask you anything. Like truly, like the, the breadth of knowledge that the show covers is is vast. So where I decided to focus my efforts were in, in, I'd say, a couple areas. But the first and most major one was gameplay. Because I'm not a huge Jeopardy fan, I was spending a lot of that time learning the rhythms of the game, learning the buzzer, trying to buzz in right away. So Brady basically... Um, made a big whiteboard in my basement with a cross hatch for of the for the Jeopardy so we just erase for each game and write in new clues and there's an archive of every game that's ever been played so he'd just go back in time and ask me those questions we'd keep score we'd subtract if I got it wrong um, so that I knew not to get over aggressive um, and do and I practice my betting strategy so that's that's another thing for sure is that there's a lot of it's basically game theory with betting right uh, you, you, you don't know what your opponent's going to bet but you have to do your best to, to try and um, try and maximize the potential for with the multiple outcomes that are possible that you will perform well. Um, so those are two things that I did. Uh, and then another thing that I did was I studied U.S. presidents, uh, which came up on my show. <laughs> so. Yes. I, it's funny. I, when I watched your episode, uh, and we got, they got to that category. I was like, it's like, good for Kyle. He really knows his U.S. presidents. <laughs> I didn't a month ago. I mean, I, I could, <laughs> I could do probably from, FDR to present uh, in order uh, before I got on the show. But then, uh, you know, it, I was sitting in a park with my parents the night before the show. We were having like a calm moment to try to get in a good headspace before I went on. But the one thing I had, my cheat sheet of U.S. presidents, my dad was quizzing me on it, like in order, one fact about each president, and I nailed it. And uh, I didn't get every question right. And so I was, I kind of rude that the one that came back to bite me was the one on John Adams, um, yeah. because it really set me up to be in a position where I... I could have won potentially had that not had it gone a different way. So um, that was that was interesting, but uh, yeah, but Madison I, I was, pretty proud. was an amazing pull. Thank you, and you know what? I, that one I said I buzzed in because I, I thought I knew it, and I was thinking it was Madison or Monroe. I was going back and forth, and I was remembering War of 1812, third president. You know, so thank you. I was I was proud of that, but it was it was on the edge. <laughs> Yeah, there were a number, there were, we, we won't go into my personal experience of watching your Jeopardy, <laughs> but there were a number of ones where I was like, good for you, Kyle, good for you. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, there was, there were, there were some I was, I was proud of in hindsight, and there were definitely some wrong responses <laughs> that I was a, a bit humiliated about, but you know, it's different when you're on the stage and you do what you can, and reading comprehension is a huge part of the show, like, you're basically speed reading those questions trying to calculate if you're going to buzz in and then just intensely watching those lights for the buzzer because um yeah i was trying to be ahead of my i wasn't re really even listening to her i was trying to speed read another interesting thing is the board is actually not the clues don't get any bigger it's the board and then the clues just illuminate so it's you know i could read them but it wasn't like when you're at home watching on tv where it fills up your whole screen and is um is, re is really like in your face yeah it's funny i was actually going to ask you about that because i was like I was wondering if maybe off to the side, obviously you wouldn't see it on camera, if maybe there was like a larger, like if the questions were blown up a little bit or something, but that's interesting. I've always wondered that about Jeopardy, whether or not like that's just what the contestants see. Well, interestingly enough, actually, the video clues are a little bit off to the side. So those ones are trickier. And there was a, there was a category with really long video clips uh, yeah. on my game about musicals, uh, which is always, I think the show uses it as a way to uh, to promote. And there's definitely some sort of free advertising that occurs there. So they milk it. But um, Go, uh, Bad Cinderella, uh, <laughs> check it out on Broadway. I, totally. <laughs> 
<laughs> that one, honestly. And I, I knew every answer in that category, but I just couldn't buzz in. That's why I kept going back to it. But the tricky one with that one is that, like, you're looking off to the side, but then you're having, to, and, it's, and it's an eternity, so you're kind of off your rhythms, and then you're still watching out of the corner of your eye for that, um, for the uh, the lights to pop off. So it's that one; those ones are tricky um, to to do for sure. And it's it's actually a person who's enabling those lights as well. Their their title is the enabler, and so once the host is finished talking or whatever, I actually didn't know this when I was taping, but I've listened to a podcast since. There's there's a guy it is a it is a guy who actually is like clicking a button to like allow those lights to go up and for you to then buzz in um when you're watching it on tv you know um i kind of think like okay well when can you start buzzing like obviously a person just can't sit there with the clicker and just click it all the time and hope to get in so how does that how exactly does that work then so they actually changed it in the 80s i think it was it was an alex trebek innovation you used to be able to buzz in whenever and the ding would go off midway through the clue. They'd finish the clue and then they'd go to that person. But it was Alex Trebek's idea to like wait until the host is finished um, speaking so that the audience at home could actually get more of a chance to participate. And it's an innovation that I think obviously has made the game so much more enjoyable for the viewer. Um, yeah, so the I practiced with a pen at home. Um, it's They call it a signaling device at Jeopardy, but really it's affectionately known as the buzzer. Um, and I'll tell you too, so on tape day, you know, I got there, did hair and makeup, they gave us the rules, um, and then they brought us onto the Trebek stage for rehearsals, which was really incredible to see that stage for the first time. It was pretty awe-inspiring. The number of lights and, uh, and cameras in that studio was unbelievable. Um, but I got up there for my first rehearsal round and I didn't get a single buzz in. And it was a little, <laughs> it, it, it kind of choked me. I was, uh, my confidence just took a major dive. I was buzzing in too early. Um, so they actually have uh, someone who's watching you and is trying to help you do your best. And so, you know, I'm walking off the stage after knowing like half the answers and not getting a single one in because my buzz was too early. So if you buzz in too early, it locks you out. So if you get in before that, uh, and it's, I think it's only a quarter second, but in the gameplay, that's like an eternity. So you're basically done unless no one else gets it. Um, so once that, that blue light goes, that's when you can hit it. And so the feel is different. It's heavier uh, than a pen. It's, the, the depression is actually not very deep. And so I was used to like full ballpoint pen. There are people, there's a book on buzzer technique. Literally, there's a guy who was on Jeopardy who wrote a book on this. Um, I didn't get it in time. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> You know, rewatching the game, it's interesting to see. I, I should do a calculation of how many questions I knew that I didn't get in for the buzz. I thought I did really well for the buzzer because I did so much better than re rehearsals. Um, but I do know for sure, um, you know, there was you know a good chunk of answers that I knew that I was like, oh, I knew that one. I really wish I could have had the chance to buzz in uh, first to get it. So I need, to, this is uh, perhaps where my Jeopardy fan is coming out. I need to know, did you practice how you were going to write your name? on the screen you know caroline it's so funny because even even the clothing there's so many little decisions that you have to make about you know am i going to wear my glasses but i was so focused on preparation and frankly not making a fool of myself i didn't even think about writing and how that would go um I, i'm sorry to disappoint you um for people who know me or work with me and have to see me write every two months that will know that i am <laughs> i have horrible penmanship absolutely horrible it is chicken scratch I, I avoid writing at any opportunity because I just, I, I'm a very fast typist. Um, so honestly, I got up there and I just basically kindergarten handed block letters, like didn't trust the, the device. Um, I thought my writing was even more blocky, but it wasn't perfect. It was extremely legible. I <laughs> thought it looked really good on there. Uh, natural, but not like you were trying too hard. You know, that's that's so nice of you to hear. That's one of the best compliments I've had because, frankly, I was trying too hard. <laughs> I was trying too hard to make it look good, but I didn't. You've seen some people do some pretty creative stuff. and Yeah, that wasn't for me. I, I, did, I wasn't in the headspace to go for that. You weren't uh, incorporating any uh, Edmonton landmarks in the way that James Holzhauer has uh, done with Vegas and his name. Next level, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not at that level of confidence for sure. I think he's earned it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before you go on, gone through rehearsal, you had some auditions, uh, but I'm always curious about the game show anecdotes. So did they, like, when did they, I guess, pre-interview you for that? or And were they like, hey, do you have, like, five fun facts about yourself? Or how did, how did that work? 
That's a great question. And it was, you know, once you get the call, they send you a package uh, with all these documents to read basically the next day. And amongst that is your basically your fun facts package. And so some of it has like top five interesting facts, but then they have a lot of leading questions that are so out there. I can't remember them all like fun travel story. Uh, most embarrassing, uh, I, I think most embarrassing experience, I can't remember if that was on there because a lot of those are probably not not good for TV. Um, but uh, w so I wrote as many as I could. I left a lot blank because I really couldn't come up with something. And again, like going back, I was just so, so uh, full on with game prep cause while working full time and raising a toddler. So like, I, I remember seeing a show recently where someone was like, yeah, I took off a few weeks to prepare for the show. I was like, wow, you really should have won because, <laughs> because, yeah, we were doing that after our son was in bed. Um, so uh, that was that was crammed in there. Um, yeah, so the, the first thing that happened when I got there in the morning uh, was they showed me a, a, a a list of the top five, basically, what what they thought were the most compelling maybe for TV. Um, and I knew what I was going to pick because, and I knew that it would have made it into that top five. So what it was there was a story about um, our adoption story, which occurred on uh, the first day of work at the Stanley A. Milner Library. I, I hadn't even been able to tell my boss, Richard Thornley, about uh, the fact that I could leave at any time. And then I ended up having to leave because <laughs> <laughs> I got the call that morning. Um, so yeah, that was the that was the anecdote I wanted to share because the coincidence was incredible. It was also you know truly the best moment of my life to be become a father on that day. Um, you know, starting a, a new job was a little bit secondary, but it wasn't an exciting time. And frankly, I remember feeling not guilty, but a little conflicted about the fact that we were opening this beautiful revitalized space within two weeks, and I had to basically check out, even though I was brought on to support that opening. You got a round of applause after it, which is not common for a Jeopardy anecdote. <laughs> you're, you're right, you know, and I, I've, it was interesting to watch that again. I remember hearing that at the time and being so touched uh, to hear that from the audience. Um, and you're right, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen it often. I'm not, again, I haven't watched a ton of Jeopardy, but I have, can't recall. Now we'll start listening for it. But it was, it was really touching to hear that. And actually... Yeah, there was a really sweet moment uh, in the audience um, where my who were my parents were sitting next to someone who asked about the story afterwards, and were so proud and and happy to hear that. And uh, um, uh, they actually hadn't um, acknowledged that they were uh, they were gay as well, and so they actually uh, kind of at that point were like, "Oh, I have a same sex partner too. This is so cool. This is maybe a part of my journey." I'm curious about what the, your other anecdotes may have been, but I know maybe you'll use those in a future uh, television endeavor, so I won't press you. Well, you'll know when when people have been on the show for a long time, they're doing much deeper cuts <laughs> because they've asked them <laughs> their top stuff for, for quite some time at that point. So I knew that what I was writing, I was writing way beyond, but I, I frankly wasn't expecting to have them get to that level of question, but you never know. Yeah, it'd be interesting to go back and kind of watch like Ken Jennings' like historic run, like after all those episodes he did, like man, he must have just been like you said going to the really deep cuts on the fun facts. It's like so when you go grocery shopping, uh, what's <laughs> something that you normally buy? Like just you know some terrible, some terrible question uh, like that. So uh, so the day of taping, you know, when you go out on the stage. You got like the actual live studio audience there. Um, did you actually get to meet uh, Mayim Bialik like before uh, taping? Did she come back and say hi to you guys? Like how, what, what was that like? Uh, no, I, I didn't get to meet her until just before when we got onto the stage and it was my turn to tape our day. Um, you know, it's interesting. Our holding area, all the Jeopardy contestants were held in the wheel on the Wheel of Fortune stage. So it was all it was all black. It was all dark in there. The wheel had a big tarp over it that said, do not under any circumstance <laughs> remove this tarp or touch the wheel, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, but it was it was a little strange and nerve wracking because we were sitting in this empty studio just watching the live feed basically of what was going on and knowing that it was it was soon to be our turn. Um, but no, I met Mayim just before the show. Um, she came and introduced her, herself uh, and you know chatted a little bit with us. And uh, you know she was she was friendly and uh, and courteous and um, you know it was great because when you did get a question right, she gave you this little smile and a yes. And it really kind of buoyed your spirits and, and uh, kind of gave you that little uh, nudge to that you're, you're doing okay. Um, so that was, that was nice. I know, I think Ken has a, a real warmth and as a past contestant, really likes to uh, interact with the contestants maybe a bit more. Um, it's not as much my style, but she was really great for the little bit I did interact with her. 
She, and, and you know what? She actually went to the audience and uh, this wouldn't have been aired, but asked them if they had any questions before they started taping for the day, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, they had some good questions for her and she was really great at engaging with them. Was Johnny Gilbert on set when you were taping? <laughs> So it's interesting. It's a lot of the parts of filming I was not completely aware of. Like there were, they had a ton of staff. Actually, it was incredible. Johnny Gilbert. I've learned this from a podcast later because he's ninety years old now. He's he's very yeah. So he's th- those are pre recorded from his home. Um, but they had a they had a a woman on on set who was um, who was doing the introductions for the day. Um, I just like Johnny Gilbert. I. I... <laughs> Still killing it at ninety. It's it's impressive. I was wondering that myself, yeah. <laughs> but I learned later. No, he was he's not on set. I've only been to one game show taping. Talked about this on the show before. Cheryl and I were at a taping of The Price Is Right, um, and obviously The Price Is Right is an hour long show, but taping took about an hour and a half because I remember there was one game where they had to like stop taping and because one of the one of the set pieces wasn't working uh how long did the actual recording of your episode take you know I don't even remember Bryce I should ask my parents but a time was like a, oh, an unknown quantity at the time I would I would guess and this is a big range uh between 45 minutes and an hour mm-hmm. um it's you know in terms of actual content there's about 20 minutes of content in a show um but uh they do they speed things up for example i asked uh, a question um i fumbled on a category once i my first time i think calling a category i just said for 600 please and they they want you to say the category as well so i caught myself but that that didn't make it to air they just showed showed me saying the correct like category and uh and number dollar value so uh, yeah, that would be my guess. My parents, I really should text them, but I think that that adds up because there's a little bit of time between games. I remember we started the Monday t- taping was around ten, maybe a little later, and I I finished just before two um, for my Wednesday day t- taping. Day taping. You, I think so. The on the the episode, you first went to the Andrew Lloyd Webber theater category. Did you? It was. Are you just running on like instinct? Did you have a strategy? I practiced a strategy, Caroline. Yeah. And in the moment, it wasn't really there. I just was like, take me where you want to go or the next category, please. I think, you no, know, honestly, I did latch onto that category early on and it became one that I just kept going back to. I know musicals pretty well. I, I don't actually care for Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, frankly. Uh, Bad Cinderella, sorry. I don't think I ever want to see that. <laughs> but uh, And nor do most people who watch that show, I think. But um, I think I got kind of stuck with that. The, the best strategy is to hunt for daily doubles. And those are found typically on uh, the bottom three rows, uh, most commonly on the second to last low row. And then I think it's the third to last and then the last row. Um, so eventually I did a bit of hunting, I'd say, but I was definitely going for categories where I had more comfort. Um, they actually told us beforehand, they said, we think the game is best played by going 200, 400, 600, 800, you know, down each a category, watch the, the, the questions get progressively harder and finish it up so it's consistent. But there was no compelling for us to do that. They weren't, they weren't telling us that that is, um, that is how they expected us, uh, us or wanted us to play it. They just suggested that. Um, and in the moment, frankly, um, yeah, I maybe got into it sometimes a daily double hunt, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, in, <laughs> I wasn't in the headspace to be able to pull that off for some, for whatever reason. And you did find a daily double in the in the double jeopardy round, I think. I did, yeah, and I, I thankfully got it right. Uh, yeah, it was a question I, I knew. On it. Yeah, two grand. You know, I didn't make it a true daily double, though. You know, regrets. <laughs> but this is the thing. This is like I was honestly when you hit that, I I was thinking that that might be a place where like if I who ha- have been a Jeopardy fan for a very long time and like have this, I don't know that I could not say I'd like to make it a true daily double. Whether or not that's a good idea, a good category, <laughs> how much money I have, like just go in on it. Whereas maybe I think you, you could just be like, okay, let's let's calm down here for a minute. Yeah, betting you know betting strategy for the daily double is a little less intense because it's more about 
you know, how many categories are left on the board? How many clues are left on the board? It's too bad I got that a little early because if people watch the show, it was a really rough start. <laughs> like one of the worst starts to the game for all the contestants. We were in the negatives or zero going into the commercial break. I was a little embarrassed about that, but, you know, we turned things around. But uh, yeah, had I gotten that a little bit later, I would have had more money to play with. Um, and I think in general, I'm a slightly risk averse person. And so if it was earlier in the game, maybe I would have gone for the true daily double. I should have, I, I like, this wasn't even close. I knew this slam dunk for sure that it was the London eye. Um, but the best part was right after I got that, it was on a high and I wasn't even thinking cause I went to the $2,000 question and gave my, my silliest response <laughs> of the day in which I answered with what, an, uh, something that was in the clue. You know, it's funny, though, because in hindsight, uh, I didn't know that I'd done that. Uh, I just thought I got something wrong. And it wasn't until after I was debriefing with my parents and I was like, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe I did that. So that was easily the most embarrassing moment on the show for all the folks at home. You know, I, I apologize. I, I wasn't thinking correctly. I know not to do that. Um, and as soon as I guessed it wrong, I knew it was County Kent. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit different when you're up there on stage. Yeah, I can only imagine, like, the... I mean, the pressure of it, the lights, you got the crowd there, you know, you're on TV. Um, yeah, it's, I've got so much respect for kind of what you did because yeah, I mean, I, as a, I've been a Jeopardy fan my whole life too. And I like to think that I know like a lot of like trivia facts and everything like that, little, little tidbits, but yeah, when you, when you watch it, it's, it's like, okay, this is a whole other ball game. Like this isn't just me playing, um, you know, uh, jeopardy on the switch or something like that so yeah. <laughs> yeah it's 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 totally different and i will say that um you know they, there's a cool website where they do stats for every game and uh i was the most aggressive player i got the most right uh of my game i also got the most wrong so <laughs> you know at the end of the day i'm happy that i'd rather do that but truly i was uh, you know in the lead up uh, you know we were talking earlier about the nerves and the preparation about 2 weeks out i was really nervous that i was going to bomb you know there was the odd practice game where my categories just didn't show up and i was not doing well and i was kind of getting in my head a bit um and also leading into the the game i actually had a really i lost my voice um in the in the week leading up and i went to the doctor and was like i need something like fix this he didn't really have anything right it was laryngitis uh, probably caused by a, a cold virus got a son in daycare it came home all the time but you know going to the airport that morning uh, to fly down to la uh, all of a sudden things pr were pretty clear and um it, it i was much less nervous the day of thankfully I even actually tried to look into the crowd to make eye contact with my mom because she is such a nervous person. And I wanted to like give her a little, I'm okay, even though I wasn't perfectly okay, just like to calm her down. But uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it wasn't quite as bad as I was expecting, but there's no doubt I was nervous. What uh, would you say is the hardest part of being on Jeopardy? I think um, possibly the speed and the mental game, I would say those two, those two aspects, um, they're, it's coming at you so fast. Um, and it's in the rehearsal rounds that you really notice like, oh, yeah, all these people are really smart, <laughs> like <laughs> to get on the show, 110,000 people take the anytime test every year. And you know, those people are already a subset of really nerdy folks in the world in North America, I should say, and 400 people get cast every year. So the odds are, are really quite low. So I'm, you know, I'm so lucky to have been on the show. But uh, it it shows you the the standard uh, to get up there, and so yeah, watching that in rehearsal, I'm like, yeah, I know geography pretty well, and then they're all getting these obscure geography ones that I knew, and I thought I was special. <laughs> so <laughs> so the mind games are tough, you know, not getting yourself psyched out if you get something wrong, um, not getting out of the game if you can, if you get a few buzzes go the wrong way. Um, as well, I think those are those are two really tricky things. And you know, it's funny uh, we were all kind of chatting all the contestants for the day about like you know what you know. You know when you get there, it's not like you're going to acquire new knowledge. You do the best you can. You get the board you get. I think my board was was decently. I was I've seen people say it, it was a tough game. Um, it was a lower scoring game I think than some for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, some people figured it was a tough game. I actually thought the categories on, on large were not horrible for me. I didn't have any of my really, really bad categories uh, that come up a lot. Like the Bible, I, I really just don't know the Bible. And so that's a pretty common one on Jeopardy. Um, there were geography categories. I would have loved a bit more on food and culture, but um, that would have, because uh, those are two categories I'm really good at. But you get what you get and you try to do your best and stay on track. And so um, those, that's what I would say are probably the hardest aspects to the show. So what what kind of advice would you give to somebody who uh, 
who I guess maybe wants to go on Jeopardy and uh, maybe they've been accepted and uh, what they can, what they should uh, prepare for. Start sooner than I did. Uh, so, um, you know, as soon as you take that anytime test, it could happen. So um, do some broader knowledge um, gathering, uh, you know, take out some books. One thing I did actually I haven't shared yet is I took out the Ken Jennings uh, Junior Genius books or what I can't remember the series, but kids books are great because what they are is they're they're fast way to get you facts. They're told in a really quick digestible format like you're there's no point in taking out a, a massive tome on uh civil war because it's you're going to spend eight like 20 hours reading about one specific topic when you really actually like you can't you don't need to discuss the tactics you need to discuss know the facts right mm -hmm. so i would start early um i would focus on definitely broadening your american uh knowledge i would maybe even watch some american tv to see commercials and um and get some american context that you may not get otherwise um and uh, yeah, definitely, you know, study that you study your presidents. That's definitely a good one as well. Um, yeah, I was just going to say for the presidents, obviously, you talked about how you prepared for it. Like when you saw that category for the U.S. presidents, were you just like, this is like this is meant to be like, like, this is incredible, <laughs> like how lucky I am this came up. Yes and no. Honestly, it's funny, Bryce, uh, looking back when I was watching the show with my friends at this watch party we held on Wednesday. I didn't remember most of the categories. Like truly, I couldn't have told you. I just, I remember some of the clues, but um, that did not stick with me. Presidents did, because I remember that one and how, how I was buzz I was buzzing in. I knew another one that I didn't get called for that Hoover one. Um, but uh, it, it felt good, but you know, presidents come up a lot and that's why I studied them. And so uh, it, it was definitely fortuitous. It's not one in two games or one in three games even that they come up, but I was feeling pretty good. But I also knew I was up against two Americans who knew their presidents probably decently. So um, yeah, it was, it was, it felt pretty good to be honest. And, but for some reason I didn't go to that category right away. If you watch the game, it's not where, where I was defaulting to, to look at on the board. Um, yeah. How did you feel when the final Jeopardy came up? The, the I guess, the category first, were you thinking, okay, I, I, I could do this, I'm here, was it, the game's almost over, were you just running on adrenaline? What was that moment like? So yeah, the category, by the way, we should mention was uh, sports and movies. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Caroline. A lot was going through my mind. First off, I was looking at that score and was like, I could actually win this <laughs> because truly up until that time it was I had almost never envisioned myself being a champion I'm um, I'm you know I may be self-critical um, but having done all the practice I did having had the horrible rehearsal I had I was truly thinking like you know have a good showing here and have fun um, but I was I was at that point I couldn't believe it and then I saw that category and I was like you know I, I know sports I watch movies. I feel pretty good about this. So the betting strategy, I won't bore the listeners too much about it. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about um, maybe the best way to bet. And it's often about um, maximizing your opportunities to win, right? Um, so uh, with that, I was... Uh, I. I you give there's pretty much a range you should bet um lower if you're feeling less conservative more conservative or like not great about the category and higher if you're thinking feeling good about the category i bet a lot i bet 9800 which had ilhana bet enough to beat me by one dollar had i doubled my score i would have beaten her because we both had uh you know we, we all got it wrong so i was feeling good about it once that music came on i was it definitely put the pressure on and seeing that clue you know what went through my mind was you know, first off, Gina Davis, I knew she was in A League of Their Own. That's her most famous movie that I know of with sports. 2012, I knew A League of Your Own did not come out in 2012. I didn't think there was a reboot or a series. I knew it would. if it was, it didn't make a lot on the box office. So I was trying to scan through my brain about big movies that came out at that time that involved sports. Nothing was coming to mind. Uh, mind. So I defaulted back to the thing that I knew, which was, was A League of Their Own and baseball. Um, and so I, I wasn't feeling super confident, but I was like, maybe Ilhana bet more. And then she bet nothing. I couldn't believe it. So the, <laughs> the thing with Final Jeopardy now is there are a lot of triple stumpers and a conservative bet is actually a smarter bet, I think, uh, in many cases. And um, I wonder if the betting strategy will ever change the popular uh, knowledge about that uh, because of how many triple stumpers there were. Um, there was one on the game prior to me as well. There was one on the Friday prior, which I actually knew the answer to. So I was pretty proud about that. I would have... <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, um, I it was uh, it was it was too bad. Um, but 
yeah, all, all told, she had me. Had I not had that Adams ruling gone the, a different way or had I not bet more on my daily double, I really would have been in uh, a position where she would have had to bet money and I would have been in the driver's seat. But uh, I could have won with $400, which would have been hilarious because the, <laughs> the, the third and second place contestants would have won with more money with, than me because uh, they get to take home 2000 and $1,000, which is funny. But then again, you know, I would have played another game and been guaranteed at least that much to win. So that's uh, that's kind of how it goes. Well, you answered my question there because I've always wondered, like, you know, I was watching it. I was like, oh, so did Kyle get to take home the $400? <laughs> yeah, only the winner gets to take home their exact amount. Um, okay, yeah. And then then actually they show it now on the on the lecterns at the at the end is they'll show 2000 and 1000 as the winnings. Um, it was all expense. It was no expenses paid for me to get down to L.A. So a lot of that will be to recoup uh, trip costs. But I've been joking that um, I'm one of the few people that hopes the Canadian dollar stays low so that my winnings uh, have a, a favorable transaction rate, exchange rate, when I when they come in probably September. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, uh, you couldn't publicly, social media-wise, share that you were going, going to be a contestant, but also you didn't need to keep it like witness protection program silent leading up to it. Um, you shared that you were going to be on the show about two weeks before uh, it happened. Uh, what was the response like? Did it surprise you? It, it totally surprised me. It was incredible. Um, the number of people from my whole, my past, my life that have, that have come, reached out to me and uh, wished me luck and just told me how cool it was and how much they'd be cheering me on. It was, it was really humbling and, and extremely um, positive and I, I felt I felt great it was great vibes I, I uh, my hometown is Kitimat BC and a, a lot of my people people from my past you know were reaching out and and uh, wishing me luck or saying that like oh I knew this was right for you from day one you know my sister posted it and she still lives in Kitimat and my two favorite comments there was my social studies nine teacher who was like I hope you remember something from my class <laughs> <laughs> and then another guy who I honestly haven't talked to in over 30 years um, he was a family friend, and I was quite a bit younger than him, but he said, I remember Kyle memorizing his dinosaurs as a toddler and thought that kid had something in him. And so uh, it was. it's cool to see that it's it's maintained to this day uh, to be on Jeopardy. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. And when Edmonton Public Library uh, shared the post that I was going to be on on, on Wednesday, I, the, you know, the support's been overwhelming, the amount of... This great c- crossover between library lovers and, and trivia fans. You know, we've got smart, um, curious... Uh, customers that love this type of stuff and so you know I, w- I definitely encourage any of them to try out as well but i the support from them and has been it's been really overwhelming i i have to share my mom it was more excited for you on jeopardy than i think anything i've done in the last several <laughs> years at <laughs> least uh she uh knows you from previous episodes of the podcast and was like oh yeah, of course i know kyle oh this is exciting so <laughs> she was uh she was very very thrilled for you i think next time she's in town i'm gonna have to meet her because she's she so, sounds just so lovely and sweet <sighs> she would love that i'm sure Another question for you just about Jeopardy before we wrap up. Um, So you've been on the show. Are you now able to, like, can you audition again to get on? Or is it kind of like a one and done type thing? It's one and done. And, you know, it's funny because when I got the call, I was not even sure I wanted it. Like, I was like, oh, this is going to be stressful. I just got, I had just got back from vacation, as I said. Um, and I just wasn't sure that I needed that in my life. And that month was not the most fun le- month. I got to tell you, I was just stressed out and one track mind preparation outside of work. Um, but I, I, it's funny when I went and filmed the show, I was kind of like, oh, I'd love, I'd love another shot at this, <laughs> especially because <laughs> I was so close. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, then I could have gone on a bit of a, a streak if I was lucky enough to have the chips fall better. Um, but uh, no, I th- and I think it's fair though, honestly. Like I've I've had my shot. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who capable people who will do a great job on the show. There's a very off chance that I could get into like a next chance tournament. But I, I think I can tell you right now, um, 
uh, I don't think this is a spoiler. By the time this airs, the person who beat me just was a two-day champion, so she lost her game last night um, to another really bright guy. Actually, I've been talking to him because he was on my tape day, and I'm lo- I'm looking forward to see how far Jared goes because he was uh, he was really a force in the background. We were doing our guesses when the other games were coming in, and I I thought right away I'm like. First off, I don't want to be up against this guy, and secondly, he he could go far. I don't know how far he went actually, so I I can't I don't have to keep that from anyone. Um, yeah, but I sorry, that's a really long answer to say. Uh, unfortunately, this is all you'll see from Kyle Marshall on 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 this edition of Jeopardy. Who knows Canada Jeopardy? Um, yeah, who knows what the future holds? Maybe I could do some trivia tournaments. I've never done that. A lot of these people are trivia champions from the states, uh, so that could be fun. So Jeopardy's out of the running. What game show would you like to go on next, if you could have any of your choice? Honestly, it would have to be another uh, trivia skill-based one. Um, not great at Family Feud. I, I Honestly, word puzzles are not my forte. I've also never really been a fan of Wheel of Fortune. Sorry for all those fans out there. I've always thought Jeopardy was much more interesting. Um, the Price is Right would be fun, and it's cool that you got to see that taped because that was my non-instructional day. Uh, <laughs> definitely, like, home on a weekday viewing as a kid. I don't think I'd, I shop enough to know prices well, though. So, I don't know. Could Who wants to be a millionaire if that came back? Or uh, are there other good trivia shows? I don't I don't have cable, so I don't really know. Well, there's The Chase, which uh, has uh, former Jeopardy champions involved with it. So Oh, uh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll have to look into that, Caroline. And of course, it's not an episode of Overdue Finds until we get a book or movie or maybe music recommendation. So, uh, Kyle, is there anything maybe you watched and enjoyed on on your trip down to L.A.? You know, the best part of coming back from L.A. was being able to listen to or read whatever I wanted rather than trying to prep for Jeopardy. So that was that was wonderful. Um, The book. You know, I honestly, I, I I haven't been consuming quite as much lately. But what I will recommend, because I know you folks like music recommendations from time to time, um, I'll give you a few albums that I'm listening to right now that I think are just wonderful. Uh, one is The Record by Boy Genius. So Boy Genius is a trio of uh, musicians, uh, Julian Baker, Lucy Dacus, I think I pronounced her name correctly, and uh, Phoebe Bridgers. And they all release solo albums on their own kind of folk, indie, pop, rock um, but they also have combined for kind of like this super group. Uh, and this album is wonderful, incredible harmonies, really clever songwriting, some great lyrics in there. Would highly recommend that. Um, there's also Feist is back in the game. And uh, she hasn't released an album in some time, but uh, Multitudes is her most recent album. And in typical Feist fashion, it's got some really cool rhythms. That first song hits you right away, and it's it's got some great... Uh, syncopation and interesting rhythms coming at you and uh it, there's some good variety in that album i think feist historically could be a bit samey uh her her tracks kind of blend together but really clever lyrics um beautiful melodies uh and uh, a calgarian to boot so those are two uh, album recommendations i'll give you kyle thank you so much for joining us today this uh has been one of my favorite recordings in a very long time uh it's been wonderful talking with you is there anything you would like to let our listeners know about while you're here yeah, I mean, I'd, we'd love to see you at the Calder Branch. I think uh, that's one thing I've plugged that I haven't before is uh, it's a beautiful location. We just celebrated five years in the space. Um, incredible natural light, uh, some great nods to the railroad history of that community. It's on 127th Street and 131st Avenue, so just south of that major intersection in northwest Edmonton. Um, yeah, we're doing some cool programs over the summer. Of course, Summer Starts is coming, starting to do maybe some outdoor programming. We've got a beautiful space outside, and uh, we've got an outdoor patio for people to enjoy nice study room so yeah come on down and and say hi to me if you can if i'm if i'm there i've got a kind of a corner office or maybe i'll be on the floor we've uh, talked on the show in the past about the beautiful uh, mosaic art that uh, calder has and i have to say it does lend itself to uh, taking a selfie so uh, if you're if you're there take a selfie share it and uh, you know tag epl in the social media as well because we love to see people taking library selfies so we hope you enjoyed today's episode if you haven't yet we encourage you to leave us a review on apple podcasts or please tell a friend about the show and of course we would love to hear from our listeners you can email us at podcast at epl.ca thank you for listening and we'll see you next time <laughs>